Um, so I'm going to talk about where we are in the climate change situation and why there started to become a lot of talk about geoengineering or as we're starting to call it, climate engineering. Um, basically because of the limitations of what we can do with mitigation and adaptation given where we are. Uh, so it'll start out conceptually and then it'll get more specific and eventually actually come back to the Arctic. Um, by the way, you can have a copy of all of these, so don't, you know, don't worry about taking notes. We can make a copy available if you want. So basically, um, the world faces a real challenge. Uh, fossil fuels provide something like 80% of the world's energy right now. So it's not something you can just give up, like you could maybe reduce air pollutants in some way or you could stop doing it. Uh, it, it supports the standard of living of 7 billion people. Uh, so it's, it's very important. Um, fossil fuel system is relatively, fossil fuels are relatively inexpensive. Um, other ones are starting to compete. Um, it's transportable, it's easy to store. I mean, it's, it's a fuel that's allowed society to develop. But on the other hand, in addition to sort of normal air pollution effects, there are a bunch of other things that are happening. Um, one of them, and the most important right now in the long term, is the issue of climate change. Uh, and the kind of impacts it will lead to, and uh, even ocean acidification, which is sort of the other climate problem, if you will. Or you might even say there are three. You might say there's climate change, there's sea level rise, and there's ocean acidification. They're sort of interrelated. But we have these problems, and so the fact that society is struggling with the issue, um, you know, is sort of understandable, uh, even if a lot of us think we're, we're not facing it as honestly quite yet as we need to. So, as I said, I'll talk about um, sort of where we are because the idea that you would later go to geoengineering or climate engineering and try and take control of the climate is a pretty audacious thought to have, that you would do something else. Uh, and so you would only do that if, for example, there was sort of no other choice. It's sort of a, uh, something of last resort that you might come to. Uh, and I want to sort of show that that's getting to be where we are. And so we perhaps need to be doing some thinking about what the options might be. Uh, most of the discussion you hear in the media is about trying to take control of the global climate. I've sort of been an advocate and sort of a lone voice of there are things to do between doing nothing and trying to take control of the global climate. And I'll talk about some of those. So just to sort of set everybody on, on the same path. This is the famous Mauna Loa record of how CO2 is going up. Um, everybody's, you know, sort of seen it. The thing I like to talk about with respect to it is to understand, um, you know, I mean, when they first started, it was sort of the mean is going up and then there are these seasonal variations. So the CO2 concentration in the northern hemisphere turns out to be high in the spring, in March, this time of year, turns out to be low in September. And and so that's a result of the biosphere of the northern hemisphere growing and pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, making it into grass and leaves and everything else. Um, if you accept that the Mauna Loa record represents the northern hemisphere, and it pretty well does, it's well mixed out over the Pacific, not near local sources and other things, and we know the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere are sort of disconnected from measurements there, and you multiply by the volume of the northern hemisphere, you can calculate how much carbon the greening of the biosphere of the northern hemisphere is doing. So when you see those NASA satellite pictures of the greening and everything. And when you do that, it turns out to be seven to eight billion tons of carbon is pulled out as a net addition to the biosphere um, season to season. So remember that number because that sort of gives a sense of billion a billion tons and what it is, seven, not seven to eight billion tons. In fact, sort of a, a useful rule of thumb is that uh, you, you don't see, the, you don't see the, the mean going up as much as the, uh, um, the annual emissions, which we're going to talk about each year, uh, because it spreads it to the southern hemisphere, where there aren't many emissions, but it sort of spreads to the southern hemisphere, and then about half is taken up by the ocean and the biosphere. So a sort of useful rule of thumb is that the global emissions are about four times this number in billions of tons of carbon. And so we'll sort of 
use that a little bit bit later. So this is one representation of the what's happening to the temperature, uh, rather than sort of show the annual variations which get people looking at all, all kinds of things. This, this sort of has the dots as the annual value from NOAA's record, but then it has 10-year averages, and what you see is sort of cool in the 19th century, uh, this sort of flat period in the center of the 20th century, and then a very steady rise since. There are some people who argue I think I put it on this slide that, you know, it's been cooling the last 10 years while well, we had a real high value in 1997, 98 due to El Nino, but if you do it on a, an, a decadal average, which is what climate's about, you sort of see a steady increase. I sort of uh, put this here to say that there's this very strange time, which is almost uh, exclusively during World War II, when the temperatures were high. Um, that's very suspicious. How did the world, I mean, you know, wh why is that happening? Did World War II do something or, or not? Um, and I'll come back to, to that in just a second. Um, so if you take the, uh, what IPCC has done and sort of one of the things this, uh, for the last several assessments is show that if you then try and model what's happening given the forcings we know, the black is observations, the blue is what happens if you model it uh, on average with just natural and solar forcing, so you see volcanic eruptions having their effects and things. Um, you just can't explain this warming in the latter part of the 20th century, um, but if you add in the anthropogenic forces, you have a pretty good fit. So this was done uh, mainly, I think, for the third assessment. In the fourth assessment, what they did was do this on a regional basis. So uh, the black is observations, the blue is natural forcings, and the red is the, the range of variations that you would get due, due to the chaotic behavior of the system when you include human forcings. And what's interesting is you get a pretty good match on the continental land values. Uh, global land does pretty well. Uh, what you see is it doesn't match over the ocean during uh, the same time I was talking about before, during World War II. Um, and it makes one sort of suspicious about what was happening then. So it's an interesting scientific uh, question about that. Um, it turns out what people are realizing is most of the measurements started to be taken by U.S. Navy ships. Other countries weren't taking as many measurements. Um, so there was a change in the mix of instrumentation. Uh, these ships... Uh, it was Navy and it was sort of U.S. freighters and things, um, and they were taking it a different way. It used to be that the way you took the sea surface temperature was throw a canvas bucket overboard, pull up water, put a thermometer in it, let it cool in the wind, sort of, as you're going along, trying to take temperature, and that's a lot of work. Um, so they took it by engine intake temperatures. They also didn't want to be out on deck doing something, sort of creating light in the middle of, at night. Um, and stuff because then U-boats would spot them or something like that. So you have some biases in what the observations are. So there's a real question about whether this change in the, in the, uh, in what happened during World War II, if I go back to that other, whoops, go back to, let me go back to this one. There's a real question about whether these are right. Um, one of the things I've been suggesting to, that they ought to do, just for interesting, uh, for interest is, uh, all the Liberty freighters, which were like, would bob like corks if you were, weren't full, but would ride low if they were heavy laden. Uh, they were heavy laden going away from the United States. They were bobbing like corks coming back. That would mean they're sampling a different depth of water. Is there a systematic difference there, for example, uh, that, that you might see? So we can get a sense of whether this isn't, isn't there. It turns out, of course, if that isn't there, uh, then this issue of what's natural and what isn't might well change a little bit because the only way to explain this if in natural forcing is to assume that this is due to solar. And so people have been talking that, that about that as a cause due to high solar radiation in the early to mid 20th century and everything. And that may just be not correct. It may be that the human influence is actually showing much earlier and we just have a problem with the measurements. There are also issues about whether sulfate aerosol emissions were sort of the cause of being a cooling influence as we went to tall stack emissions for SO2 as it compared to surface emissions. Um, so as a result of, uh, come on, 
you know, here we As a result of these detection attribution studies, over time, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has sort of strengthened its, its statements about uh, climate change, saying that warming of the system is unequivocal, and most of the, not just a little bit, but most of the observed increase is very likely, meaning 90% probability or more, due to observed increase in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. If you're actually there in the discussions in that the natural influences are going down, we've had less volcanic eruptions in some sense, and the solar has been tilting down a little bit, uh, some of us were sort of arguing you should be saying more than most, you know, a little bit more, and we're offsetting, but that was too complicated. So, so IPCC, which is the you know, full international set of countries is basically uh, saying be very cautious in, in this regard. They're not, they're not a cutting edge organization. When you have to get 190 organizations to agree unanimously to something, that's not cutting edge science. And so the sort of cutting edge science, if you go to Jim Hansen, you go to others, will say, um, you know, it's sort of behind the times and you, they're even more worried about it, but that's sort of where we are. Okay, so what about the future, where are we? Um, this is emissions, we're project, I mean, this was projections in 2000. You know, scientists don't like to be wrong, so they choose a wide window of what you think it's gonna be. Um, scientists chose a pretty broad window of possibilities, and it turns out CO2 emissions have been growing in the upper range of what was projected, uh, even with the recession. I don't have a value for 2011, but it's almost certainly higher. We're headed up, uh, so, the efforts to try and limit growth in emissions don't seem to be working, which is a significant concern. This is the IPCC chart of what the projection is for the future, except I've renormalized it. They normalize it as warming since the year 1990, and yet the international leaders in agreement is that it's warming since pre-industrial that you want to count, and that a two degree warming is probably the dangerous level that might be referred to in the UN Framework Convention, so if you get two degrees warmer than pre-industrial, you'd be worried about it. Um, that's what the leaders sort of chose because they didn't think they could keep it from being less than that, but quite a number of people think that that's probably far too high, that you should really be not going much, I mean, given we're at 0.8 degrees warmer than pre-industrial or so, and we're already starting to thaw Greenland and, and Antarctica, uh, going up to two degrees, something to be pretty worried about. But what's interesting, if you look at these projections, almost independent of emission scenario, they get up to two degrees by sort of the middle of the century um, and are headed far above that with their low, medium, and high scenarios. And this low scenario is sort of everything green works um, kind of scenario. Um, and, and then there's sort of a high emission scenario, which is sort of keep going with coal. Um, but one starts getting well above this two degree kind of level. Um, in fact, uh, Climate Interactive keeps an interesting scoreboard about where the nations are. So they, they basically said, well, I don't want to be two, so let, uh, let's say a safe level is between one and a half and two. As I said, some people would say that's too high, but anyway. So where are we headed with business as usual? We're headed to something like 4.8 if you, by 2100 if countries don't do anything, but all the commitments they made, even if they live up to them, only get us down to four. And you're sort of getting a sense that the countries aren't near further agreement to get us down. So that's a pretty problematic situation. And that's the level by 2100 with potential for warming thereafter. Um, so what I want to sort of do in leading toward what the role of uh, climate engineering might be is sort of put that chart out there. So this is sort of looking ahead to 2300, so not just to 2100 because we go further. The, the blue sort of gives an indication of where we are with respect to pre-industrial, so we're up six or eight tenths of a degree or something here. And this is where the projections go if you're at 2300 if we don't do anything. So they go way up to, you know, eight degrees C, some huge number um, for for the scenarios that assume a fragmented world and we try and do things. So the challenge for world policymakers is to try and get this down to some lower level, of course, and we'll sort of go through what the options are for trying to get through that. Um, yeah, and I should recognize, I mean, these are big numbers. Uh, you know, six degrees is sort of between a glacial and the present or the present and the Cretaceous, roughly speaking. 
So, so what can we do? Well, what can we tolerate? What level of impacts can we tolerate? This is just sort of a summary slide of the kinds of things that we have changing. We have CO2 and greenhouse gases, temperature, a whole bunch of things. And these are large categories of impacts. As I said, energy is a benefit to society. Fossil fuel energy is a benefit to society. So some little impact isn't going to get you to change the world energy system. Uh, maybe some big ones will. I mean, if you have important health impacts, you have a lot of people, so that can be a big number. Agricultural impacts with respect to food are important. Forest impacts on the fiber and the resources that come from forests, water, coastal areas from sea level rise, ecosystem impacts, and some societal impacts for indigenous peoples and, and other things. So there's some range of, of impacts uh, that exist. Let me just say where we are with respect to this ocean acidification, which doesn't get much talked to. Uh, but um, this upper one is a map from 1850. The green area is the areas that are favorable for most kinds of coral. And the blue dots are where the coral occurs. And you see most of the coral is occurring in that favorable chemical area. This is for the year 2000. Just the pure chemistry of having dissolved that CO2 into the water is changing, changes the chemistry making it less favorable. So there's much smaller green areas, still some yellow tolerable areas perhaps. By 2050, if we continue on this path, you lose those areas. And this is sort of an equivalent about what happens to ocean pH. It's been going along at some nice level and then it crashes. Um, now, or it goes down and becomes much more acidic. acidic. Um, one of the questions that comes up is, so wait a minute, during the Cretaceous, the CO2 concentration was 15 to 1,800 parts per million. How come all these organisms didn't die? Well, you had a lot more time, uh, a lot longer time for the acidity of the precipitation to sort of weather the rocks and change ocean composition and so, sort of buffer it, sort of get some Alka-Seltzer into the ocean. Um, and so the organisms could survive, but basically we're really putting at risk a lot of different aspects of uh, ocean marine system. Uh, so this was sort of a summary chart that came out after the fourth assessment, giving a sense by amount of warming that occurs, one to five degrees or something by 2100, and what are the kinds of impacts that occur. Um, and there's a whole range of them, and this is just a starting one. But um, I mean, there's some sense that uh, and, and there can be a lot of disagreement. I mean, this has large scale shifts in the climate system might not occur for a bit longer. There's some people who see elements of that now. Um, there's issues about crop yields in vulnerable areas versus improving crop yields in some areas through the CO2. There's interest about uh, what's happening in high latitude regions where they're already experiencing many impacts. Uh, Bonnie knows about small mountain glaciers and stuff and how that's changing already. Um, and, and we're losing that and it affects water supply. So there are a lot of things happening. And, and choosing a number like two degrees for global average temperature here means that you're going to have some impacts. You're going to have some serious impacts, even if you can stay below this two degree level. And if you go above that, they start to get more and more serious. OK, so let's take this chart of ours and, and say, OK, so maybe looking at the impacts we can toler up tolerate up to one and a half or two degrees. I mean, we can later bounce these numbers up and down if you want, if you have different choices. But let's say that. So this is, this is the, I've got to get rid of the emissions that cause that much if I want to try and have the world avoid getting into this dangerous zone, which might mean that you get relatively sudden changes. You might get enough that you're you're headed on the way to the total loss of the Greenland ice sheet or most of the Greenland ice sheet, or you're thawing the permafrost and putting a lot of methane in the atmosphere or something. OK, so we've got a lot to go. So what are the sort of options that exist to do that? Let's try and consider the full range. If you start with this sort of circle of life, if you will, about how we do it, uh, I mean, we all want to have sort of improved well-being. People around the world certainly want that. That means you have to have some goods and services, which takes some energy and food, which leads to some emissions, which changes atmospheric concentrations, uh, which changes the climate and sea level and things, which causes impacts on ecosystems and things, which affects our well-being. So you sort of have a circle here. Um, and 
So where can you intervene? Well, if you say, um, okay, I'm just gonna not try and live uh, so, uh, with so much consumption, I can try and invoke conservation. Uh, I can improve the efficiency uh, so I don't take so much energy to produce the products I have. Um, I can change what technologies I use to get energy, moving away from fossil fuels to renewables. Um, if I could prevent the CO2 from going in the atmosphere or pull it out of the atmosphere, that would be helpful. So that's carbon dioxide removal, which is a climate engineering approach we'll, I'll get back to. Um, if I can make it so that higher concentrations in the atmosphere don't change the climate, that would be nice. Um, I'd like to do something on ocean acidification, but that's a bit harder. Um, but if I can sort of offset the, the increased trapping of infrared energy by reflecting some additional solar energy, maybe I can limit the climate effects. Um, I can adapt and say, well, I'm just going to get along. I'm going to change my ways. I'll have a different climate. The world can survive and I'll do it. Or the one that's often forgotten, I just suffer through it and have all kinds of consequences um, about it. All right, so let's uh, talk first about the ones that are traditionally talked about, sort of sometimes lumped together as mit mitigation, conservation, efficiency, and, and changing technologies. Um, so there's a lot of potential for efficiency. I mean, the National Academy in 1992 and several reports since basically point out that you can reduce U.S. emissions by something like 30% with existing technologies that have a payback period of three years or less. So there's a lot we can do. Compact fluorescent lights, how are we doing here? Something like that. Um, you know, but all kinds of green energy things that one can do are sort of in conservation and efficiency. Do, do less. This might mean you eat less meat or something like that. There's a whole range of uh, sort of uh, mitigation options. Most of the discussion focuses on CO2. The international discussions all talk about CO2, or they say CO2 equivalent, so they sort of compare everything to CO2. Um, and so there's a whole range of technologies. Sometimes the arguments end up being between them. They sort of circle the wagons and shoot in instead of uh, you know, trying to realize that we need all of the above in some sense. So that's sort of the state with these first ones. Um, and as I say, um, People then make pro projections. This is actually just the existing forcing that we have, but, but they make projections about future forcing. I'll show some in a minute. And so there are these different gases. CO2 is the dominant one causing the radiative forcing or warming influence. They're almost exactly the same size, and that's because these other greenhouse gases are offset by sulfate aerosols and a cooling influence, and people sort of assume, oh, that will continue in the future, and so all I worry about is CO2. Um, I should say I learned a lot about this when I was on a, appointed to a panel for a, a, UN, a UN panel to prepare a report for the Commission on Sustainable Development. And John Holdren, who's now science advisor, was chair of the mitigation panel. And he said it's a CO2 problem. I was in charge of the climate panel and trying to get Jim Hansen on. And at the time, he was saying it's a methane and black carbon problem. And my reaction was, these are two bright people. What's going on? Um, and it's been interesting how over recent times this has been figured out, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Okay, so if you want to deal with CO2 and you say you want to stop the CO2 forcing, these are the kinds of cutbacks that you have to make. So if you want the CO2 constant, this is uh, the, the emissions cutbacks you have to make. So to stop the CO2 concentration from rising, which would mean stopping the radiative forcing from increasing, um, I have to go to 80 to 100% changeover. Uh, for our control of CO2 emissions. So the world energy system that is 80% dependent right now on fossil fuels, I have to make, so it's, I have to reduce those emissions by 80%. So that's a huge, at least, so that's a huge challenge to do. Okay, um, and this is sort of the warming influence. As you see, you have to go 80% just to stop it from sort of warming in, in this case and, and uh, to try and pull it back down, as Jim Hansen argues, to get to half a degree, you really have to do a good deal more than that. So uh, faced with this problem between um, this difference between Jim Hansen and John Holdren, uh, I decided to try some sort of simple experiments to get an insight. And I basically said, well, 
the question is, what can we do by, between now and 2100? And so what matters are the emissions between now and 2100. Those are the ones I can deal something with. And so I first did a, I just took Tom Wigley's little magic model, so it's a simple energy balance model, but it has a pretty good radiation scheme in it. Uh, I took that and I said, okay, I'm just going to turn off all emissions in the first decade of the 21st century. And what happens? Well, um, the red, which is uh, methane here, it has a lifetime of 10 years. And so the excess methane concentration sort of disappears in a decade or so. Um, some, some of the other ones, like, uh, let's see, I mean, tropospheric ozone has a lifetime that's even less, and it disappears even more rapidly. Uh, some of the, uh, high, the, this is, I guess, in, this is the hal halogens, there's some N2O in here and everything. But CO2, as you know, has a relatively long lifetime or a set of lifetimes. And so what happens is I'm left with a sort of legacy of CO2 warming from previous emissions. So even if I could go to zero emissions tomorrow, um, you know, I'd be left with this. Now this is decreasing, so that's nice, but these went away. This is an interesting amount that went away. Um, so then what I did was said, well, I want to understand what happens for emissions from the 21st century, and so this is sort of doing that. Um, so this is this legacy, mostly CO2, from previous times. If you add in the CO2 that is projected from the 21st century, you get a warming influence that goes down a little bit and then come, will come back up. It takes a while because CO2 has a long lifetime to build up and everything. And so I build up CO2, so the CO2 continuing would be this. Now, this will continue long afterwards, so I don't want to say it's not important. Anyway. But to get up to the total forcing that's going on, I have methane and ozone. And so methane and ozone, if, I mean, if this is, if you, uh, this warming influence is basically sort of related to the area. The warming influence that exerts through the 21st century is, is related to the area. And so the area of the methane and the ozone, so the warming contribution of, of methane and ozone during the 21st century is about the same as for CO2 emissions emitted during the 21st century. So if I only deal with CO2, I still have these ones left. So I'm going to have to think about these. Plus I have black carbon, which is sort of sitting up here in some uncertain sort of way on top of these things that would continue. Um, could have started here, but it, it continues at another warming influence. So pretty clearly, if I just focus on CO2, that's not going to do it. And the problem has been, the problem that John Holdren had in looking at, and it's uh, sort of embedded in the IPCC reports, is if you look at the forcings in the year 2000, and you look at projected forcings in 2100, if what you do, which is what John did, was compare the changes in forcing, so you see a much higher bar in CO2, but the methane's about the same, and you say, oh, I'm gonna pay attention to the change in CO2, um, you're leaving out the fact that all that methane that was creating a bar of, of influence in 2100 occurred between 28 and 2080 and 2100, and in fact, black carbon occurred in just the few weeks before 2100, because the lifetime is a week or two or three or something like that, except for albedo effects, but it's, it's pretty short. Um, and so the, the problem is that people were looking at changes in heights of the bars instead of realizing you have to compare for some of those things the whole height of the bar. And when you do that, you find that, as I say, this methane and ozone is really important. Um, now it turns out, so Jim Hansen was right. Now it turns out a, a year or two later after that, however, Jim Hansen switched and now he's focused all on coal powered power plants and isn't doing this. Um, I was lucky enough in the Copenhagen science meeting before the Copenhagen COP meeting to, to, to give a talk right before Jim Hansen. So I could tell my story about this argument and that he was actually right and that he'd, he'd then switched to coal. But he said, well, yeah, you're right. And other people in his group um, have been focusing on these other ones as well. And so uh, what that, le that led to in part, sort of indirectly, was the United Nations Environment Program put out a major assessment uh, last year, I guess, and there's an article in Science by Drew Schindel and, and others about this that talks about the importance of black carbon and tropospheric ozone. Now they, uh, could also include methane, and they actually did in some of these things, but 
Um, what they show is actually very interesting, and this is sort of the most complicated figure. I don't know why they didn't do a simpler one, but okay. So this is this is the observed temperature coming up, and so they have a few different scenarios. If you do nothing, so the reference scenario is this green bar. Why it's green when that's the least green solution, I don't know, but okay. So this is what happens if you don't do anything. The temperature goes up, it passes this two degrees by sort of the middle of the century and keeps on heading up. If you do CO2 measures only, that is if you aggressively control CO2, um, because of its long lifetime, because of the inertia in the system, you don't start getting cooling till toward the middle of the century, almost independent of the CO2 scenario. It's really, really important to control CO2 to get at the long-term increase in temperature for the world, but it doesn't do much over the next 50 years, which is another reason that's a little hard in a policy sense. If you control the CO2 and methane and black carbon, I mean, if you, I'm sorry, if you control methane and black carbon, you get this blue curve. And what you see is, and they go through 15 technologies that exist today and talk about some cutbacks that you can make uh, all quite readily that have many co-benefits for health and other things, you get a, a significant cooling before 2050. And in fact, you cut the warming that's expected between now and 2050 about in half. So doing CO2 doesn't do much of anything, but if you control the short-lived gases, that, that works really well. Now, that doesn't do much good afterwards because once you've removed them, you've removed them and then you've got CO2, so this curve continues up. So if you do both CO2 to get the long term and these other things to get the short term, then you can actually try and stay less than two degrees. So it's kind of interesting what the potential is here. Um, so if you want a strategy for what the world should be doing right now, in my view, it's uh, push on CO2, and that really is the responsibility to a large extent of developed countries to show that you can have a modern economy on lo with low CO2 emissions, and we haven't shown that, and it's a little hard to preach at China and India until we show that. Um, you know, limit deforestation and other kind of things. Um, so that's the, that addresses the long-term thing. And there was an academy report not long ago that talked about it, and it almost exclusively focused on CO2 because it was aimed at the long-term. But if you want to slow things in the short-term, Everybody needs to work on methane and tropospheric ozone precursors and black carbon. Uh, black carbon emissions in the U.S. are higher than the world average on a per capita basis, mainly because we have a lot of old diesel construction vehicles that need filters and things. So there's a lot we can do on these kind of things. Uh, you may have noted in uh, February, finally, Secretary Clinton announced, oh yeah, we're going to start you know, putting a few million dollars into trying to get at short-lived species. Um, this is something that's really, really important to be working on. Um, the, the trouble internationally is they use this global warming potential. Uh, now that was a concept developed by a colleague of mine at Livermore, <laughs> but it turns out it's been sort of misused and it, um, it basically hides this near-term potential because it converts everything to look like it has a lifetime of CO2. And so it doesn't show what you can do by going after these short-lived species. Okay, so if you go after both of these, if you really work aggressively, you can maybe take away a lot of this excess we got to get rid of. Um, and this is sort of a strategy that gets us to 550 parts per million. Okay, so you say, okay, you know, um, how, five, let's say 550 parts per million of CO2. Forget the other, let's assume we do the other things as well. We're at 390 now, so that's 160 parts per million. Um, if you remember that sort of rule of thumb before, that if I want to know from parts per million to emissions, I multiply by four, that gets me 640 billion tons of carbon that I can emit during the 20th century, 21st century. Well, the emissions in the year 2000 were 6.5 or something like that. So if we could keep emissions level at the year 2100 through the whole century, and then go to zero in 2100, uh, that would get us to this curve. Well, that would be a nice kind of goal to get to. The trouble is we're already up at about eight or nine. So we've gone from six and a half to eight or nine in, the, in just the first decade because of all the growth that's occurring. So we're not on a track to basically get this low. And we're gonna have to work hard to do that. We can go up, but that means we're gonna have to 
to go down even lower in the second half of the century. So we're on a track, and that's well above two degrees global warming. So now what? Well, let's talk about carbon dioxide removal. Can that do anything? Um, now, the other one, I've already taken care of deforestation. So if I'm going to talk about climate engineering and get additional carbon out, I have to grow forests in new places. Well, first I have to find the land, and I have to have the nutrients, and I have to have the water. So that's a challenge on that one. Um, you know, there is this notion, um, it's called sort of a biochar principle of gathering up available biomass that's not being used for food, converting it into charcoal, and then burying it in the soils. Um, it's a little strange to do because charcoal is actually a fuel, and, and so why not use it to displace burning fossil fuels? But anyway, if you can bur bury it in the soils, uh, that can be helpful. It actually helps hold moisture in the soil, so it has other advantages if you can do that. But there's some limits about how much you can do. Uh, you can use biofuels to the extent you can. People have talked about using biofuels with sequestration, I mean with uh, fossil fuels and sequester all the CO2, and there are some ways to think about doing that, but again, you have a certain amount of capacity or something. People have talked about fertilizing the ocean, where there are areas of the ocean where there seem to be excess nutrients, and it's missing a micronutrient that comes from dust normally, but can you fertilize it with iron? It turns out you can make nice blooms, um, but does that sequester the carbon down in the deep ocean isn't clear, and are those nutrients used somewhere else later, and so you're really just not having much effect. Um, and then there's this notion, can I just industrially scrub CO2 from the atmosphere? Um, well, in the atmosphere, the concentration is, you know, 0.04 percent or something like that. Um, you know, in, the, in a power plant plume, it's 10 percent, and industry is having a hard time doing that economically when it's 10 percent. So scavenging it when it's 0.04 percent is going to be pretty expensive, uh, but that's sort of another option. So um, it's worth researching, but um, I think, the, you know, and, and looking at these various mechanisms for doing it, but if you actually sort of try and go through it quantitatively um, about how you might do it, this is a sense of what the budgets are now. Let me say that, okay, so this is what you might, oops, push the wrong button. Um, this is what you might do. This column is the way we scientists talk, that is billions of tons of carbon, keeping track of all the carbon atoms. This is the way the negotiators talk. They talk about millions of metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So you multiply by and get a big number so they are happy they're dealing with big numbers or something. But, but let's sort of talk here. Okay, so fossil fuel emissions are eight to nine billion tons of carbon. And remember when I said the CO2 curve at Mauna Loa, that variation between spring and fall, so the net greening of the biosphere is seven or eight. So this is a big number, okay? So this is equivalent to all the green vegetation in the northern hemisphere that you put, okay. Deforestation's adding a bit more. Okay, so how much could I sort of put somewhere? Well, standing biomass above ground is maybe 600 uh, billion tons of carbon here, so 600, okay. So if my emissions are 10 and I'm going for 100 years, if I go at constant emissions, um, you know, for 100 years, that's almost 1,000 here. So that's bigger than all the standing biomass in the ground, I mean, above, ab above ground. So, gee, maybe I can get a little bit here. Um, there's more in the soils if I can sort of encourage roots to grow and things like that. Uh, maybe estimates are if I could sort of fertilize everywhere in the ocean there are excess nutrients, I could do one. Uh, maybe reforestation, I can find some new areas to do it, maybe another one. I mean, I could cut existing forests and bury the tree trunks under, under the ocean or something. Um, people have talked about carbon scrubbing. Maybe you get to one. Who knows? Uh, it, uh, if you're lucky, come on here. If you're lucky, if you really work at it, um, you know, neglect my math. You can maybe get to three or four, something like that. That's really hard. We'd have to work to do that. That's huge. And as long as emissions are eight to nine, and growing at a rate of 5% a year or something, this isn't just gonna, this isn't gonna really do much. And so if you put it on this, oh, I should say just as a reference, that's roughly equivalent to a harvesting, whatever, a 60th of the low latitude forest every year and putting it underground. So a huge amount of stuff. Um, if you do that, 
and try and build up on this chart, maybe you can have this much. So I'm being generous here, I'm being generous here, and I'm still above the one and a half or two degrees. I've, I've still got this area here uh, to deal with. Um, you know, if I sort of do best efforts or something like that. Um, so that gets to maybe this next option of solar radiation management. Is there something I could do to limit climate change um, in other ways? And so the discussion has gone on about seeing if that, if maybe I could do this. Now there's a lot of concerns about it, um, not just that it's sort of audacious, but you probably have to do it for a long time. So it's passing on an obligation to future generations and there's all kinds of ethical issues that arise that I won't get into, but there whole, let me talk about the practice of it first or something. So how might you do that? Um, so this sort of left set of options is the storing carbon. Okay, so if I want to reflect more radiation to space, how could I do that? I could do it maybe in space, um, uh, sort of put a mirror up there, and there are some ideas that have been proposed about that. Uh, the problem of putting it in near-Earth orbit is that if you wanted to it, it turns out CO2 doubling is equivalent to about a 2% change in solar radiation. So half of a CO2 doubling is sort of 1%. So if I want to do that, I'd have to cover, I'd have to reflect radiation over 1% of the Earth. And if you calculate the area, which the National Academy did in a 19, it's 1992 report, um, I, I want to put up some sheets, say, of aluminum or something, hopefully long-lasting. Um, I'd have to, and, and each one, I have to put up, in their calculation, 50,000 of them, and each of them is 10 by 10 kilometers. Okay. All right. And you go, that ain't going to work. Okay. All right. So another guy came up with uh, a guy named Jim Early, who turns out actually to have been at Livermore, um, came up with the idea, well, if I go to the first Lagrange point, which is 1.6 million kilometers toward the sun, where there's equal gravitational pull, uh, if I put a deflector there, um, I can deflect radiation around the Earth, or reflect it, or whatever. And so we did a calculation of how big that has to be, and it would have to be something like 1,500 kilometers in diameter. Okay. Um, and his least expensive way of doing that was to build a manufacturing plant on the moon. Okay. So this has a long time constant and a lot of money involved. Uh, there is a guy, Jim Angel, who came up with a different approach, which is shooting a whole bunch of mini parasols up from, from Earth all the way to this point. Um, it's as costly, and you have to have a lot of them, and each of them would sort of sail in the solar wind and stuff like that. It's, at least that's incremental, which is nice, uh, but the cost is huge. I think it was sort of la launching rockets with 800,000 of these little parasols you know, quite a number per day or something for 50 years or some, some huge numbers. Okay, so the next one is to think about the stratosphere. We know that volcanoes actually have an effect in trying to do that, so I'll talk about that. There are some ideas in the troposphere that sort of relate to the fact we're doing it now in some sense. It's sort of a cooling effect. And maybe you can think about a, a surface-based system. So I'll cover those briefly. Okay, so a volcano, we know when Pinatubo went up, um, you know, it put a lot of ash, in, ash, but the long-lasting thing was sulfate in the atmosphere. It, it increased the optical depth. It actually reduced the temperature. Uh, Jim Hansen did an interesting model run early in this process, making a guess of how long the stuff would last, and actually simulated it quite well, so it was a nice model test. Um, so conceptually, one could do that. The question is how much you have to do. Now, it's really strange, though, that you can actually offset solar radiation to to counterbalance CO2 radiative force. Um, and this is sort of a question that's been bothering me. Maybe you'll figure out how to, why it works, be a good risk. So if you look at CO2 forcing from a CO2 doubling, it's about even and smooth all across the planet and by season. Okay, so that's nice and smooth. If I look at solar radiation over the Earth, it has a huge seasonal dependence. Um, and latitudinal dependence. Uh, so you actually get as much solar radiation in the, you know, at the, uh, in, in the summer uh, solstice here at high latitudes as you do at low latitudes. 
I mean, 24 hours throughout the day at the top of the atmosphere or something, and then of course you get seasons with zero. So how does changing this by some percentage counterbalance this? Okay, does it? Should it work? Um, I mean, it sort of says it doesn't matter how you do reduce radiation, which is what the IPCC assumes. So some people have done it in model simulations. Manabe did it in the 1980s. This is from Ken Caldera several years ago. Uh, so this is what the world looks like with two times CO2, several degree warming in the polar regions, a little less in lower latitudes because you have evaporative cooling making up so much. I mean, people say, oh, it doesn't warm as much in low latitudes. Uh, yeah, and so that's better. Well, yeah, it's, a, it's evaporating more moisture, so your precipitation systems end up heavier. Uh, not necessarily a good outcome. Um, but if you put in, if you reduce solar radiation, it turns out by 1.8% in this, you get back to, over the globe, virtually no change. And it turns out that works out uh, seasonally as well. Uh, it also reduces the changes where there are significant changes in precipitation. Uh, so surprisingly, you can, uh, this might work. Um, we just had everybody a little surprised. Um, how might you get stuff up there? Um, I mean, how, we don't have a volcano. Um, it turns out there are ideas, and the National Academy went through a bunch of them in 1992, but there are some other ones. I mean, it turns out putting up a few, imitating Pinatubo and get a few million tons of sulfur into the stratosphere, you can actually do it with a hose held up by a balloon or a few of them and just pump SO2 up during the year. Um, the Academy's proposal for the least expensive one was just take artillery pieces and shoot projectiles up from low latitude islands. Um, but people have talked about doing aircraft and there are other crazier ideas. Um, but there are issues about getting it in the right form so you farm sulfate particles and so there's a whole field about that. I don't want to talk about that at the moment. So Alan Robach's done an interesting calculation where he just sort of does it. He does a lot of calculations of putting in volcanic aerosols so he's sort of geared up to do it. So this is the world going along and then suddenly in this time a few years ago he sort of imposes a few changes. The red is what happens if you have uh, nothing happening uh, and, and everything. And then the blue is if you put it just in the Arctic. Uh, and I'll come back to that later. And then these other ones are for bigger ones over the planet. And if you wanted, you could take it back to the 19th century temperature, is what he's saying. And he sort of did this a, one or two a year or whatever it was. He did it out 20 years. The problem, of course, if you, if you stop, the warming influence is there, and so you're going to pop back up. So, but you could conceive that you could change amounts and do something to try and control it if you can figure out the governance and a whole bunch of other, lots of other issues. Um, he worries, in his papers, he talks mostly about all the impacts that would occur of popping back up. Uh, for me, I think the impacts of going down into the state wouldn't be so great either. But um, it's sort of a notion about doing that. Um, actually, what you'd really want to do, presumably, is sort of come out, if you're going to engineer it, try and come out somehow about where we are, or a little bit cooler so you're not warming, maybe. Okay, so what about the troposphere? Well, we already put SO2 in the, in the troposphere, and we exert a cooling influence, so maybe we could do more of that. The trouble is where we put it, and I'll come back to that. Um, there's an effort to brighten, uh, talking about brighten, how to brighten clouds. Uh, can we increase the reflectivity of the surface or the ocean? Um, and so there's some ideas of how to do this. Um, since I won't, well, let me just say for the reflectivity of the land, there isn't much area to do it. And the problem is, of course, you're below cloud deck. So the area you have to do outside of the clouds turns out to be pretty great. So the higher in the atmosphere you can do it, or above space, the easier it is to do, but, or harder if you have to reach that. Um, there are some ideas about just trying to imitate a ship wake and blow micro bubbles into the into the water and try and have them last because that'll whiten the ocean a little bit. But let me say something about this brightening clouds because that gets a lot of attention. Okay, so uh, two scientists, um, Latham and Salter, have sort of proposed this. Um, it's based on if you look from satellites over marine stratus clouds and you, you see things that look like contrails going through the clouds. And those turn out to be tracks from ships that are putting out diesel exhaust. And so they're putting out a lot of little particles. And if you have more little particles where the rain condense, where the water condenses, then large, then a few large particles, it's brighter. So conceptually, that's the idea, except I don't want to do it with 
with fossil fuels, so they've constructed, they propose these ships. These are trimorans, about the size of a clipper ship, and uh, these are sails. Um, now, they look a lot, little bit strange. They're done that way because then you don't have to have a crew. These are called Flettner rotors. They were invented by the Germans in the 1930s, and the idea is these are stacks and they rotate. And so on one side of the stack versus the other, you get a different wind speed going by because of the relative motion of the stack. It's just like an airplane wing turned on, you know, turned vertically or something, you're actually affecting it. And so the Bernoulli effect actually gives this a thrust through the water. And so they have then a propeller out here that then runs a turbine and you bl blast this stuff out into the atmosphere. It's just very, very small sea salt particles. And there's actually a fellow who uh, was the inventor of the inkjet for the Hewlett Packard company that is trying to work on this issue of how do you put out small droplets so that they don't condense. And he's actually figured out an interesting way of doing it. He said he can flood his laboratory with cloud condensation nuclei quite easily. So conceptually, it could be done, and, and if you estimate to offset the CO2, you only have to build a dozen or two of these things per year and then just uh, put them out under marine stratus decks, and people have been doing some climate modeling to see how that all works. Um, conceptually, it might work, um, and stuff that's actually kind of intriguing. And you might, one of the very intriguing things is you say, well, so how much water do I have to pump if you have all these things for doing something? It's about the amount of water that comes out in the Bellagio fountains in Las Vegas. You know, I mean, it's not a lot of water, and nobody's quite figured out how you do an environmental impact statement for just pumping that amount of water up into the air, and somehow that's going to change the climate. Um, I mean, if you fire fire hoses up, what? They don't make you do an environmental impact statement. What if these people do it? It's all in the size of the particles that makes a difference. Okay, so you can have these various approaches. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things to consider about them, cost and scalability and stuff. Uh, there aren't any that are sort of best. Some people say stratospheric aerosols are, but they have some impacts, uh, risk impacts to ozone and to, to whitening of the sky and other things. Um, and then there's governance issues and everything, so nothing's great, but there are some range. So what I've been thinking, as I mentioned earlier, is are there some things, instead of going after the global climate, let's first try and do something that focuses on a specific impact. Let's see if we can alleviate the worst impacts. That's what we're worried about. So one of the things we're worried about is losing the Arctic. So can I moderate warming in the Arctic? And that would have benefits for other things. Could I reduce the intensification of hurricanes as projected? Uh, could I nudge storm tracks so I don't have droughts or something like that? And I'll talk about some of these things here. So let me just go through and give you a sense of these. I mean, you know what's happening to sea ice. It's going disappearing rapidly. The Arctic assessment talked a lot about what's happening and the impacts in the region. There's a lot in the region that, you know, whether it's issues of you know, oil companies going up and shipping and freighting companies or loss of species or permafrost thawing, there's a whole bunch of other issues for the rest of the area. Um, so the question is, might it be possible? Um, gee, if I could do it, I only have to reduce the solar radiation through a few months. I don't have to do it all year long. Um, and it turns out, in some model simulations we've done recently, it turns out because of the f positive feedbacks in the Arctic, if you can reduce it in the Arctic, the, the amount of benefit you get in reflection is several times as large as you do if you do it spread over the globe. Um, so there are a whole bunch of potential benefits. It'd be nice to do. I mean, if I can sustain sea ice, I help with the weather and everything and river and coastal ice. Uh, um, it turns out one of the, in I think I actually have it and I'll, I'll go to it, but one of the interesting things is, I mean, can I help sustain mountain glaciers and ice sheets, limit permafrost thawing and help in the weather? So some experiments are done. These are the ones uh, from uh, Ken Caldera and Lowell Wood where you go just up to the Arctic and you reduce the amount of solar radiation coming in. How you do it wasn't the question at this point, but I want to reduce it and this is to try and offset CO2 doubling. Um, so, whoops. All right, so they, they tried to offset CO2 doubling with these kind of simulations, and the interesting thing is um, they can bring the temperature down back to pre-industrial. Um, you know, if you can reduce it 25% north of 71, which is sort of only over the Arctic Ocean, or 10% from 61 up for CO2 doubling, we're not added doubling, so I don't have to do those high percentages. The interesting thing is precipitation doesn't come down. And 
And, so, and the reason for that is most of the hydrologic cycle is driven at lower latitudes. And so where you have increased CO2 providing increased energy to drive the hydrologic cycle, that keeps going. And so I have increased precipitation, I have this sustained increase of precipitation, but now it's cooler, so maybe it comes as snow, restores the snow and ice. I won't go into detail, but we've tried, to, it, it turns out that if you do something in the northern hemisphere, so you make it colder, you draw heat from the hemisphere, uh, that switches the intertropical convergence zone a little bit, so you'd actually like to do some in the southern hemisphere to sort of balance that out. And if you do that, which is sort of what these simulations in this column are doing, you can actually reduce uh, the warming pretty significantly over not just the polar regions, but a little bit over the Earth. Another thing is uh, people are worried about, of course, is ice stream retreat. Um, so it's going back and everything. Uh, one of the hypotheses about why it's retreating is that there's um, warm water coming in from adjacent areas, for example, from Davis Strait and Baffin Bay and those, uh, those other areas in there, uh, Labrador Sea. Um, now, warm water means it's a few degrees above freezing, but it's coming in low and calving away. So are there things I could do? There are people who have talked about blocking the fjord to try and keep the warm water from coming in. But could I use that uh, cloud brightening for just a few months during the summer and do that? Could I blow bubbles in the open water to try and make it bright for just a couple of months to try and reduce heat uptake uh, in that region? Might that be possible? Uh, I mean, the, the, the real problem with Greenland, it used to be when I was young, um, we all thought Greenland wasn't something you had to worry about because that was ice up on land and it takes a lot of heat content to, to melt it. But it turns out if you do radar as they did down through it, much of Greenland is below sea level and so that makes it sort of more like the West Antarctic. You have these fee hordes, Jakobshaven and these other ones. Um, and so can that be lost relatively rapidly uh, is the concern. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the IPCC estimates and everybody else about what sea level rise will be. Um, you maybe know the, one of the things we've all been sort of arguing about is this is an indication of IPCC being very cautious. Uh, Susan Solomon wanted to be really rigorous, and so these are the sea level rise projected by IPCC, but just from the terms of uh, thermal expansion of the ocean melting of mountain glaciers, uh, I think it, it was, uh, or the only terms, and she left out, well, and then energy budget on top of the ice sheets, but she left out because they don't know, nobody had a good representation of the ice flow effects of that. So. That gives a lower number. If you look at some of the other things, or if you take a, if you try and figure out what it might be, this isn't feet, I should say, I'm sorry. But, but if you do an analog, for example, approach, and you say, well, the peak of the last glacial, it was six degrees colder on a global average temperature, sea level was down 120 meters. That's 20 meters per degree. Is that the equilibrium value? I mean, they're talking about a half a meter change or something like that for a four degree warming. Um, so Greenland, who knows? Okay, um, might it be possible to, to moderate driving force intensification of cyclones? Well, could I brighten the clouds in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, or in the Caribbean and some other areas so I don't get as much solar absorption during the year and so I keep the temperature down a degree or two? I don't know, it's worth, seems to me, thinking about. Um, can I redirect storm tracks? It turns out, of course, Pacific Ocean temperatures have a lot to do and give us good evidence that storm tracks tend to follow some of these gradients. Jerry Namias back in the 70s was talking a lot about this. So could I use the clouds to modify exactly what's happening? Um, let me just say something about Australia. Australia um, depends on, a precipita on precipitation from a storm track across southern Australia. In fact, two storm tracks. The main circum Antarctic one is actually shifted south of, of Australia. And so in southwest Australia, they're saying they have a 40-year drought. Uh, let me tell you, that's being optimistic. Um, if you have a drought for 40 years, it's probably a change instead of a drought. I mean, we don't say the Sahara Desert is having a drought, something like that. And so, so they're really in trouble with respect to that one. It turns out there's another storm track that comes down from the Indian Ocean that sometimes cuts across Australia, and it depends on the temperature out into the west of Australia where there are marine stratus clouds. So could you brighten these clouds in this clean area out here, modify temperature gradients in particular years, and at least give them some precipitation? Now the trouble is that some may be a lot, so 
you can have all kinds of problems. Same thing's true for the southwestern United States. The model simulations all project expansion of the subtropics and drying of this region. Um, and you know that persisting here is Texas, right? Um, you know, so drying of this region, is there a way to try and make sure the storm track switch, swings back and forth a little bit? So um, finally, I, I think is this issue of if you clean up CO2 emissions, you probably reduce SO2 emissions from coal-fired power plants. And so that's going to create a warming influence. Uh, IPCC had a very misleading diagram, in my view, um, last time from that earlier one, they, they had a curve where they said, well, we'll hold everything constant. It was sort of this yellow or golden curve and it showed, they wanted to show thermal expansion. Well, you can't hold CO2 concentration constant and SO2 concentration constant with sulfates in the same way because SO2 has a lifetime of a week or two and CO2 has a lifetime of millennia. And so you have to cut back the CO2 much more than the SO2. And uh, they sort of show that. So that was actually a geoengineering curve in their report, but they didn't comment about it that way. So uh, I guess what I would say is there's a whole bunch of potential options. There are a, poten a number of potential things that you might do. They're in various stages of uh, conceptual design. There's been virtually no research. Um, people say, oh, geoengineering would be very dangerous and uncertain, and I guess I would say in retreat, uh, in response, Global warming without geoengineering will be very dangerous and uncertain. Um, so we end up being faced, uh, maybe it's gonna, we end up being faced with a choice um, sort of of comparative risk of continuing on this path of the globe warming, not quite knowing where we're going, but some sort of ever increasing environmental risk, or saying, well, we're gonna try and do something and offset one kind of climate change with another, which has also tremendous implications and ethical ones. Um, but that's sort of where society is at the moment, and that's kind of a troubling uh, situation. So the choice is up to us, but it's gonna really matter to the polar bear and, and others. So, yeah, thanks. So oh, I went a little long. Sorry questions. about that. If uh, you have to slip out, please do so. I know some of the students have may have to go to the next class, but um, so you all have been to polar regions. Does anything I make say make sense? <laughs> it's so hard to think of the large amounts of energy that you have to change, but no, let the students get out. <laughs> Any questions? I can't have been that clear. <laughs> What's the book? No, maybe it was just that frightening. Yeah. But even if, even if we're able to implement some of these ideas, don't you think we need to, to really pursue conservation and efficiency and everything else as well? Because we do have constraints on energy. Uh, you know, water may be the, the, the real uh, linchpin to our continued existence civilization, so the water cycles are, are going to be affected as well. You know, the acidification problem isn't fixed. You know, I worry about adopting some of these practices and everybody thinks, oh, problem solved, let's keep burning, let's keep fracking, let's keep uh, drilling oil in the Arctic and the deep water, and uh, it's business as usual in every other respect except temperature rising. Well, you're exactly right, and people talk about sort of that slippery slope, that, that people will think about geoengineering as an alternative instead of as a, a you know, sort of last resort complement to doing mitigation and adaptation. And so, I, I mean, I sort of try to show, I mean, that little bit of geoengineering that you might do if you don't do the mitigation and the other things isn't going to make a hill of beans a difference. Um, I mean, there's... Uh, uh, what's being recognized even in the global sense is that um, you can super you can s saturate the capacity of adding SO2 to the stratosphere. That is particles, as you put more SO2 up there trying to do more geoengineering, the particles start getting bigger. And bigger particles don't have the same effect. And so you basically have sort of a maximum effect you could do that way. Um, and 
um, so you can't do this as an alternative. You have to do mitigation and, uh, well, and efficiency and conservation and all that, uh, plus adaptation as well. Um, so we have to do everything. And that's, the, you know, that's one of the real conceptual problems here is people think, oh, I can find one thing to do and that will do it. And that's no longer the case. How many of you know the first year that this issue was raised to the President of the United States' attention? Anybody know? Take a guess. You remember? Did you? You want to guess? Do you have a guess? Oh, well, let me, let me just get the answer to this. Okay. President Johnson, 1965. President Science Advisory Council sent a report to him about doing something. We haven't done something for 50 years. It's why we're in this predicament, you know, or done much. And, uh, you know, even what we've done, we've done some things, but not necessarily related to this. So things are getting very uh, desperate, and it's why we start talking about these additional things. Yeah, Fran. Um, well, let me tell you that something, there's something out for review. Maybe you want to comment on it, friend. Um, okay, so internationally, the way CO2 is being addressed, as I said, was global warming potential for 100 years. So it has the long-term stuff. But there hasn't been anything for short-term. And so quite independently in this country, um, some industry leaders, I guess, were complaining about well, how are we supposed to account for sustainability? And it turns out back in the time of President Hoover, who was an engineer, um, they formed something called the American National Standards Institute. And that was to have things set. And so that's the strength of screws and bolts and materials and everything. But the, among the other things they've gotten into doing is um, laying out the system by which you would do carbon accounting. Okay, so people talk about the carbon footprint. So that's been the first thing that people have done. But the trouble with the carbon footprint and global warming potential is it looks long term and it's hard to do impacts. So a group of them, a committee was formed. I mean, it's a committee of environmental groups and public interest groups and industry and, and government people have formed something um, in going through their process and come up with a way for an, rules for an accounting system for company contribution, for activities, not government contributions or whatever, to warming out to 2050. So instead of taking global warming potential, which is the long-term thing, they're saying, we want to know the short term. We want to know the relative priority of getting things at the short term. And so they have come up with this metric. Um, and so the interesting thing is this metric changes with time. I mean, by the time you get to 2049, if you really want to do something, black carbon is going to have a huge one because if you could do black carbon, it would take it out of the atmosphere and have a huge effect by there, where CO2 isn't going to make much difference at that point. Um, but what this accounting system does is start to give increasing importance to these short-lived species. Now, it's only an accounting system. It's only a way that companies and governments and everything would add up all these different things and compare and get priorities. Uh, for it to do something more, governments are going to have to decide, oh, well, I want your thing to be less than this or less than that or set some rules. Now, it's interesting, ANSI, this group, is the US official representative to the International Standards Organization. And if a few countries take the standard to the international organization, it gets considered. And that happens a lot, I guess, with strength of bolts and all these other things. Um, and, and so there's already plans to do that. So this standard is presently out for review. And it really compile, it has a bunch of sections that get at um, use of natural, re I mean, it's aimed at sustainability, not just climate change, but it has a section on climate change. 
but it has on use of resources, uh, air pollution, a whole bunch of other things. It's an actual very interesting standard. Um, but as I say, it's a way of accounting. Um, interestingly, okay, so it was unanimously approved by this committee. So why did, uh, well, okay, so the government agency on the committee was DOE, but it turns out by law and Congress delegation of things back in 1928 or whatever, <laughs> 30 or something, um, US agencies have to pay attention to it. So EPA might have to pay attention to it. So they're actively reviewing it. Uh, a member of US Steel was on the committee. Why are they interested in, in this and why did they vote for it to go for it? Well, as I understand it, they're interested in there being good standards that apply to everybody. Um, and so when the Bay Bridge replacement was being built in San Francisco and they were trying to decide where you get the steel from, a comparison was made of the carbon footprint of Chinese steel to U.S. steel. U.S. steel was only a little bit better, and so Chinese steel was chosen because it was cheaper. Okay. If, however, they'd been using the new standard, which accounts for a whole bunch of other things, uh, U.S. steel would have won by, U.S. steel generally, small case steel, not right, would have won tremendously because this one includes some of these short-lived pollutants. So the fact that China builds some of its coal-fired, I mean, its steel building plants right in cities, and the air pollution comes out and has damage to all those people's health, counts. Whereas if the steel companies here have cleaned up or have built in rural areas, they don't have those impacts. And so apparently industry has sort of said, has been endorsing this process so far. Nobody's quite sure what's going to happen as they go through this review and people realize, holy Toledo, if this passes, we have to do an accounting. There's already an effort made to say, well, we may not get a law through Congress, but one of the ways is if these companies do this, can we get the results out and shown transparently? So there's something, what's the, the carbon, what's the, the carbon project that exists? There's a carbon, ex, there's a Carbon Disclosure Project, I think it is, which is some, it's a committee or, or group that represents like $30 trillion of investments, okay? And they've all gotten together and they send out to all the companies in the world and, and some stuff, uh, things to do your carbon footprint. And that's one of the spur that's led Walmart to start cleaning up and stuff because you start counting all of these things and what your suppliers are doing. If groups like that sort of start adopting it, then there's going to be public exposure of what things count. And interestingly, they have, you might want to look at this because Guy's Polar Research Center, um, their measure, their metric for climate has four parts. It has a part related to global warming, a part related to um, Arctic warming as the driving force, okay, um, ocean acidification and ocean warming. So the Arctic warming is where this registry idea is coming in. I mean, it turns out ships going out there put out soot and it falls on the snow. Okay, so that has an added effect. If you put out soot on Samoa or something like that and the black carbon is out over the ocean because the dark carbon and the ocean are sort of the same color instead of much darker than the snow, you don't affect solar absorption. So it matters where you do it. Same thing goes with tropospheric ozone. It'll matter which season you do that and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting, and it matters for forests. Um, if you, uh, you know, a lot of the black carbon comes from forest fires. So would forestry management in high latitudes, so you do your prescribed burns in the fall or something so it doesn't burn the next year or whatever it is, would that limit black carbon? So can you do things? So there are some, some things that people do. In fact, um, I was telling you I was at this SCORE meeting, so Scientific Committee on Ocean Research. I'm the atmospheric, internet, I've been the, atmospheric international rep to the ocean guys for a while. Okay, we met in Helsinki and they took us to this, Finland's the only country that is completely locked in by sea ice every winter. Okay, and so they have become specialists in designing icebreakers and they say they have a company or something or two that design 80% of the world's icebreakers. And so they took us out to hear about all the icebreakers. And we saw an hour and a half presentation of new icebreakers that they're building. I mean, they had more slides than Al Gore had. It was just unbelievable. Okay. And I finally couldn't contain myself anymore <laughs> and asked, so aren't those going to do something? I, know, I mean, what's the net effect of all the icebreakers? 
And the guy sort of poo-pooed the idea and stuff, but I thought about it some more and then talked to them afterwards. And, and it turns out, I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious that if you go through with an icebreaker and go through fresh sea ice in the spring when, and everything, and you break it up into smaller pieces, you'll get faster melting and you'll get more absorption because there's more water there. If, however, you go through in the fall, when the sea ice is forming, the ice is insulating the water from the atmosphere. And so breaking up the ice will allow heat to escape to the atmosphere and that heat loss will lead to thicker ice. So if you, what you would want to have happen, ideally, is have these icebreakers not go through fresh snow and ice, especially close to land in the spring where it, the animals are on it and the seals and everything and it drifts out to sea. Um, in the summer, it doesn't matter so much because the albedo's down a lot, but in the, in the fall, you want them to run through the fall and the winter as much as you can or something like that to get heat loss going to the atmosphere and try and build the ice up so that it is thicker going into the next spring and lasts longer. So it may be that icebreaker operations are something that you do. Um, so there are some things you can do about trying to do something about the Arctic. So this new standard um, is out for review between a week or two ago and uh, June 12th, um, and you can uh, find it on the American National Standards Institute website, I think, um, and um, it's kind of interesting. Um, they came to us to ask us about things a few years ago, and, and we gave them some responses, and then they came back with us, and we said, oh my heavens, we better make sure it, it reconciles with IPCC, which is one of the things we've been trying to make sure it does, and I think it does. But.